Welcome. Thank you for joining our Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance Best Practice Series webinar. I'm Becky Melody, your hostess for today's presentation, and Jerry Anderson, USDM Vice President for Compliance Products and GRC Practice Leader, will be presenting. The discussion today will cover introductions, webinar logistics, direction for post-webinar collaboration, and our discussion topic, Computer Validation 101 for Compliance in the Life Sciences. Jerry Anderson offers 29 years of experience as an IT techie, an IT manager, validation lead, and QA oversight roles within the regulated industry. Jerry leads the USDM GRC practice and he's a subject matter expert for compliance products. He's a well-known industry speaker on validation, part 11, security, infrastructure, qualification, and change control. And we're proud to say he's a contributing author for Gantt 5. The content today will be covered in approximately 60 minutes. Then we'll invite you to post questions for our team via the iLink message board on the lower left of your screen, or you can join the discussion on LinkedIn and post questions there. In addition, I'm happy to address any questions offline, and my contact you see is rmelody at usdatamanagement.com. U.S. data management is focused exclusively on the life science domain, and we're a market leader in providing IT, quality and regulatory IT compliance, professional service solutions. Our various dedicated practices include PLM, ERP, CRM, GRC, ECM, and clinical and drug safety. We're headquartered in Ventura, California, and we've delivered more than 1,000 successful projects with over 150 life science clients. We offer hands-on experience in assisting clients under regulatory distress, and we're a market leader for validation accelerator packs. You can see here a few of our various uh, clients, and at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Jerry. Well, hello everyone. It's good to be with you today. Um, I understand there are quite a few of you out there and uh, I've taken a look at some names and recognize a few, so I want to say hi to uh, former and current colleagues as well. Today we'll be talking about um, basic validation principles for computer systems as well as Part 11 and additional areas that companies need to focus on to make sure their systems are compliant and will pass inspections. We're going to talk about some specific things like risk-based validation, what really constitutes risk associated with a computer system, what kind of validation deliverables you need to develop for different risk systems, what Part 11 is really all about and what it takes to be compliant with it. Whether or not you can uh, use vendor validated software without going through validation activities yourself. And we'll talk a little bit about supplier audits and also what it takes to keep a computer system in compliance after it's been validated. I want to say though, um, this is a fairly meaty subject and we've got less than an hour now, so we're absolutely not going to be able to cover everything that you need to know about computer validation, Part 11, or general compliance issues. What we're really striving for here is to get an overview of current industry and regulatory agency expectations for computer compliance, really targeting people who are new to the life sciences industry but have responsibilities for computer compliance or possibly people in management who, who haven't ever been hands-on with computer validation or Part 11, um, but have people working for them and who do that and therefore inherit the responsibility to be compliant. Finally, um, please give us your feedback on this session and on things you'd like to see in the future. We're always interested in making sure that our webinars really answer the questions that you've, you've got. 
um, and that our webinars cover topics that uh, are burning issues for you guys. We want to we want to address your pain points. So, first of all, what do we mean by computer validation? What is it really all about? Computer validation is about assuring that you've built the right system. And by that I mean you're building a system that actually satisfies your user requirements or business process requirements. We do this by capturing the user requirements into a user requirement specification. Then we translate these into somewhat more detailed technical specifications called functional specifications that the techie people can actually use to then go design and build a system. Finally, once we've got a developed system, we go through some formal acceptance testing um, in our industry known as IQ, OQ, and TQ to verify that the system actually meets those requirements. That's really only part of validation. The other part is assuring that the system was built in the right way. So you could theoretically have a system that passes all your validation testing and then falls apart the next day or the next week or the next month because it wasn't built in the right way. So along with validation all through the process of specifying and developing and testing the system, we try to assure good software quality assurance principles are followed, good system engineering practices are used when building the system. Um, configuration management is in place to assure that we keep track of, of the versions of software that we're developing or implementing, the versions of documentation. Um, we do um, bug tracking as a part of configuration management. Um, we have uh, development testing that should happen well before our formal acceptance testing. And uh, if we're actually writing code, we need code reviews. Um, if, we're, if we're configuring or writing code or, or just putting together a lot of different pieces to form our final system, we typically have a design document and go through an independent design review. And of course, at least for our formal testing, our IQ, OQ, and PQ, we need independent test reviews as well. These are all part of, of good engineering and good software quality assurance practices. Finally, once we get the system validated and deployed and, and release it to the users, uh, that's great. Our validation represents a snapshot, a picture in time. We can proudly declare that the system is validated today. Um, but as time goes on, we make changes to the system, we add users to the system, we might upgrade the version of the system. Um, computers tend to have problems. Um, we have to worry about security intrusions. So we write procedures to create a number of different processes during the what we call the maintenance phase or the production use phase. And these are along the lines of how do the, the techies administer the system, how do they do backups and restores, um, change control. We, we want to we want to document and test any change that occurred to the system. Um, uh, Kyle and Becky, um, it sounds like uh, the users aren't muted. Um, if you can, if you can uh, address that, it'd probably be more enjoyable for everybody. Um, we need processes in place for problem management. Um, we need a process to ensure that users are trained in system use before they're given access to the system. And we have things called periodic evaluations every year or two years or possibly three years. We need to go back and take a hard look at our, our overall system to make sure it's still in a validated state. So what are FDA expectations around computer systems? Um, at a very high level, they want those systems to be compliant, not just with computer regulations like Part 11, but also you know, when we create a computer system to automate a regulated process or to manage regulated records, um, we have to comply with the predicate rules 
the other FDA regulations that, that talk about those records or that talk about those processes. So whatever functionality we have in the computer system and however we create our records, we have to make sure that, that they're compliant with those, with those um, predicate rule regulations. We also have to be compliant with FDA expectations about using computers in general. Part of that is validation. Um, part of that is 21 CFR Part 11, which is all about computers, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. Also at a high level, they want us to assure that um, the system protects the security and integrity of the records that it manages. It's not a good thing if I'm able to go into a system and alter data on a record that, um, that you created or even delete the record uh, if I'm not supposed to be authorized to do that. And they want the systems to have high quality, meaning it's not good enough that they work now. They should continue to do so and be fit for their intended purpose throughout the lifetime of the system. Now, if you look at the FDA regulations other than 21 CFR Part 11, um, they don't really tell you what to do when you're using computer systems. Um, certainly for those of you who work for pharmaceutical companies who are following Parts um, 210 and 211 for your GMPs, um, they talk a little bit about using automated systems and um, they talk about uh, validation, they talk about calibration, um, but they don't tell you anything about what that means. The quality system regulation, Part 820, for the device companies has a lot more to say about using uh, computer systems, um, using software in the devices, and using um, support systems, software support systems for production and distribution and uh, device tracking. But once again, they don't tell you what it is you have to do, or rather how to do it. There is an FDA guidance document on um, software validations, general principles of software validation is the title. Um, and and it, it goes into some detail about different methodologies you could use. And it says there are different ways to skin that validation cat. Uh, but it doesn't tell you what, what the right way is. Um, it, it doesn't provide you with a full methodology and the different activities you should do or how to do them. So FDA, and I'm going out on a limb here by saying this, but um, it's no surprise to a lot of you who've been around this, this area for a while. Um, FDA's current thinking really revolves in part around ISPE GAMP, Good Automated Manufacturing Practices Group, uh, ISPE GAMP 5, a risk-based approach to compliant GXP computerized systems. And so um, industry has naturally gravitated to using GAMP5 because they want to be doing it the way that, um, that represents current agency thinking. Uh, it's not just FDA. Um, pretty much any regulatory agency's expectations around computer validation and compliance um, they don't necessarily directly reference GAMP5. Um, but if you follow the principles in GAMP-5, you'll go a very long ways towards achieving compliance for international regulatory bodies. The reason I also have GAMP-4 listed up here, uh, GAMP-4 was an older version of the GAMP guide, um, is because it, it's still, its processes are still very prevalent in the life science industries, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. I mentioned international regulatory expectations. Uh, you need to be aware, probably already are, that um, you have to comply with the regulatory requirements in every country where you do business. Uh, if you have facilities located out of the USA or if you distribute product outside the USA, you're subject to regulation and inspection by um, by the countries where you do business and also you know, for, for um, countries that aggregate like the European Union. Um, the European Union has their own regulatory body, the EMEA. This is an example, these first bullets of uh, GMPs for the EU. 
and they have a specific um, Annex 11 that talks about computerized systems, and they expect you to comply with it if you're doing business in the EU. And then there are additional guidance documents, not regulatory requirements, but guidance documents that represent um, the, the thinking of regulatory agencies around computer compliance. And the best one I can think of is the PICS guidance, Good Practices for Computerized Systems in Regulated GXP Environments. It, it actually has some prescriptive advice and goes into some detail. It's a, it's a reasonably long guidance document. If you don't have it, it's free. Just go out there on the web and search for it. Um, but as I mentioned, if all you had available to you was the camp guide and you followed it religiously and um, did your due diligence in all the uh, other process areas for compliance, um, my guess is, you know, I, I can't say you won't get 483 observations, but um, the inspectors won't go crazy on you. So if GAMP provides so important, what's in it, Jerry? Um, it's basically, it, it covers a life cycle approach to system development and deployment and maintenance in the production phase. It's very heavily um, oriented towards a risk-based approach, meaning um, don't give every computer system you have the same compliance effort. You've got limited time and money and people. Um, they ought to be spending that, that limited time uh, focusing on the higher risk systems. And, and we'll talk about that in some detail in a few moments. It talk, excuse me. It talks about um, what your company should do to demonstrate that you've done your due diligence when inspectors and auditors come around. It talks about what the people who are supplying you computer software and services should be doing to demonstrate their own quality processes. And it has numerous appendices. Most of the document is really appendix, appendixes um, that, that talk about in some detail the various uh, validation deliverables. You know, there's, there's a piece that covers each specification, a piece that covers each test, uh, type of test, um, as well as you know, various areas that should be covered as management processes. Um, it talks about the different procedures that I mentioned need to be in place um, to maintain a state of control. Um, it, it's really a great book. If, if you're new to computer compliance, get your company to buy you a copy of, of CAMP 5 from ISPE. Now I mentioned uh, I'm leaving CAMP 4 in this, this publication. It's older. It's been around. It was published in 2001. Um, it was very much more focused on um, life science terminology, uh, not as much risk-based. It, it, it had methodologies that the V model methodologies that were kind of prescriptive um, told you these are the things that you need to deliver for this type of system. And um, GAMP 5 was published in 2008. It's very much more risk-based in its approach. Um, it, it doesn't exactly tell you everything you need to do. It gives you some suggestions. But for instance, you know, if you're validating a, a medium risk versus a low risk system, um, it, it tells you you can have different deliverables and activities associated with those. Uh, but it's kind of up to you to write your own procedures and decide what your company is going to do. And your risk-based approach may vary because your company may not have an appetite to take on very much risk. Or you might be a very wealthy company and have a lot of people to devote to computer compliance. On the other hand, if you're a startup company and you haven't gone through your first inspection yet and you're still working on getting your first commercial product, you're probably running very lean and uh, maybe haven't thought about computer systems at all. So when you get around to tackling them, um, you're going to have to take a risk-based approach by necessity. 
It also uses, GAMP5 uses more generalized terminology. Um, they talk more in terms of the, the IEEE approach to uh, software development and testing that the rest of the world uses, not so much life science terminology like IQ, OQ, and PQ. Um, good news is that GAMP5 says uh, with some emphasis that we can leverage the supplier's testing. We'll talk about what that means uh, in a few moments. Um, finally, it just adds more areas, more technical areas of coverage and more compliance areas of coverage that weren't in GAMP4 yet. Data migration is an example. Um, the reason GAMP4 stays in this presentation is because back when it came out, um, a lot of life science companies rewrote their computer compliance procedures to adopt what was in GAMP4 the methodologies, the activities and deliverables. Since 2008, some companies have rewritten procedures again to adopt a more heavily based risk approach and to leverage supplier testing and all the neat things that are in GAMP 5. Some have not. Um, but even those that have still have a lot of GAMP 4 in there. For instance, they're still doing cranking out IQ, OQ, and PQ tests. So. We really have a hybrid of GAMP4 and GAMP5 going on out there. And that's perfectly acceptable, by the way. This is kind of a graphical view of computer validation. What you have in the big box down below are kind of the, the big phases of the typical computer validation project uh, for a fairly complex system, I'll add. Um, and up above, you have sort of processes that run along some or all of these phases. Um, over to the left you have requirements where you're gathering um, user slash business process requirements into a document that you can reference throughout the whole project. You turn those into functional specifications which eventually in the next block become a design. And then you build and test the system. And by testing at this point, I mean development testing. Typically your IT group or a vendor will want to make sure that everything's working before they turn it over to the validation group and, and quality for acceptance testing. Once acceptance testing passes and you release the hounds or the users, um, you go into the maintenance phase where you try to maintain that state of control throughout the lifetime of production use of the system. And finally, because this is a validated, regulated system, when we get around to retiring it or replacing it, we want to do so in a very structured, orderly way. So we typically have a process around retirement too. Up above, you have some processes that um, are, are oversight processes. Um, and they need to be in place or else computer validation projects can go very wrong. Um, the one on top is project management. It's very important because if the project isn't managed well, um, a lot of the acceptance testing comes at the end right before go live. And if you've got a drop dead go live date that's been handed you by management and any of those requirement or design or build and test phases take too long, um, you're shrinking the size of that acceptance testing block on the timeline until pretty soon you have no time at all and people are trying to get you to hustle very quickly through formal validation testing. And that's never a good thing to do. And I encourage you all to push back on that as much as you can without losing your jobs. You have configuration management that kind of runs the whole length of your validation effort. Um, something that the medical device people will recognize, design controls. Um, in this case, they're also required for computer systems used in pharma. And we'll talk about that when we get to vendor audits. And then the testing phase, which encompasses development testing by the technical people, as well as formal acceptance testing. When you're writing specifications in the um, uh, specifications phase. I want to make sure that uh, you know that it's not just some consultant that should come in or, or some validation person. 
really you need to identify a process expert, a subject matter expert, um, maybe somebody who will eventually be a system owner who can get down on paper everything possible about what, what the users will need from this system in order to be able to do the job right and in a compliant way when they start using a computer. Then the technical people will step in and create, uh, start to create functional specs and design specs uh, to kind of imagine a computer system and how it will be built in order to satisfy those user needs. Testing is also a team effort, um, very much so. Uh, those of you who have been through a validation project know it. Um, you typically have to have somebody who, who knows the system reasonably well uh, do the testing. Best case is some other individual, not the tester, actually writes the test scripts. Um, that person also has to know the system pretty well. Once the tests are uh, written, they need to be pre-approved, then they're executed, and then independently reviewed by a validation person, and then finally post-approved by hopefully the system owner and validation and quality. Change control, which is part of that configuration management process, once again also a team effort. Um, it really needs to start early in the project. As soon as you've written your first validation document, you have to keep good configuration management, not necessarily full-blown change control, but keep good track of the versioning of, and the approval status of your documents. Certainly before you begin testing, formal acceptance testing, you need to implement change control on your, your test environment and your production environment. Uh, if you have multiple environments, which is always the best case, so that no unanticipated changes happen um, that will make tests fail, or that you might not catch during testing, but that will potentially make the system fail once it's released to users. Finally, project management is important for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, we're going to talk in, in some detail about requirements, design specs, things like that, all the validation deliverables uh, in a few moments. I mean, this is kind of a, a graphical picture along my software development lifecycle blocks. Um, you're cranking out user requirement specifications, that's what the URS stands for, functional specifications, possibly design specifications, possibly other documents as well during the requirements and design phases. These will um, feed into the creation of what we're still calling the IQ, OQ, and PQ formal acceptance tests um, that will be executed during acceptance testing. And if they're accepted by the people that need to uh, approve them, uh, that's the key for going live with the system. So this is kind of a scary slide. If you've never done validation before, this is a lot of stuff that needs to be delivered. Um, and this is a worst case. If, if you're writing your own custom software, you're actually developing software code, um, building what um, the GAMP people would call a software category 5 custom system, um, you're going to need yourself in the life sciences industry a validation plan saying here's how we're going to assure that that we build the right system and build it the right way. You'll need that user requirement specification that says what the users need, the functional spec that says what the system must do, a design specification saying how the system will be built to do it, possibly a configuration specification to capture configuration settings if, if the system is uh, going to be configured, um, an IQ to ensure that it's installed correctly, an OQ to assure that it, its software functions function correctly, and a PQ or performance qualification that goes back to the user requirements and verifies that it, it properly automates the user's process or ma manages properly the user's regulated records. And we're not done yet. Um, once we've conducted our testing or written our tests, we need to develop a traceability matrix 
And this simply ties every user requirement to one or more tests so that we prove we've got, gotten full test coverage. Uh, we prove that every requirement has been tested to assure it, that it's been met. And then a validation report or a validation final report. The validation plan says this is what we're going to do. And validation report says this is what we did and here's how it went. But we're not done yet. Because we're writing software code, we need to be conducting um, design reviews. We need to be conducting code reviews. We need to have coding standards in place so that different people who are writing code will write it fundamentally the same way and comment the code with some standards. We have a lot of development testing that needs to be done. When, when we're ready to release the system, we have to make sure we've got the users trained. That usually means developing and delivering a training package for the system and its use. And all those procedures that I mentioned, all those processes that need to be in place once the system goes live to assure that um, it's maintained in a state of control, now we've we got to write those. <laughs> so we need to develop, or we could leverage if they're already developed, uh, procedures for how to use this system properly, um, how it should be administered by the IT techies, um, and possibly by the system owner, um, how to keep it safe and secure, change control, which I already mentioned, how to manage incidents and problems when they occur. That's an area that a lot of companies don't focus attention on, and they really need to. Um, most, hopefully all, life science com companies have uh, processes in place when there are problems with, uh, with the product, with the device, or with the drug, or with raw materials, um, with testing. Uh, that if something goes wrong, they conduct investigations and do um, CAPA, corrective actions and preventive actions. You need to do the same kind of thing when you have problems with a validated computer system as well. Uh, you have to be able to identify what constitutes a real problem that, that threatens um, patient or product or even just threatens the safety and security and integrity of the regulated data. And um, it needs to include something along the lines of a root cause investigation and corrective actions and preventive actions. And certainly, um, if IT or uh, an outside company has to change the computer system in order to fix a problem, you also have to implement your change control process. Um, then we've got a lot of other um, procedures that need to be in place, of course, backup and, and restore, uh, business contingency, how, how you continue to conduct business if you have to while the computer system is not available because of a problem, um, and then how will you gracefully get the um, data that you collected manually during that period of time back into the computer system um, while maintaining the integrity of the data once it's available again. Um, disaster recovery. I don't know how many of your companies have actual full-blown disaster recovery plans. Um, in my experience working for and consulting with um, a lot of life science organizations, this is typically the last thing that IT does unless it's, once again, a large wealthy company with, with a lot of people in IT to, uh, to take on that task. But you should have um, at least minimal plans in place. You should do minimal testing of your plans. Um, if you guys have um, um, automated devi uh, device and patient tracking systems in the medical device world, uh, those things really need to be available to you 24-7. Um, if you have in the device or the pharma world uh, an adverse event computerized system, um, that one needs to be available 24-7 too. Uh, so when you're inspected, uh, it's very much the case that an inspector can ask to see what, what you've got in place in case um, your, your adverse event computer system goes down. How will you quickly bring it back up? Do you have uh, another uh, similar 
or, or mirrored computer system, or do you have one available to you at a, at a warm site off campus, um, or do you just have a plan in place to uh, quickly rebuild the system in, in case of something goes terribly wrong? Um, don't ask me how I know. Um, well, that was two slides worth of stuff that you have to deliver to make those systems compliant. And I'm here to tell you that's not all of it. The good news is we don't usually write our own software and build custom systems in, in the device world and the pharma world. That's sort of the province of companies like Oracle. And then we buy their software. Um, more good news is if you're buying software that's heavily used in the life science industry, uh, the suppliers you're buying from recognize that um, the use of, of the software that they're selling you is going to be regulated, sometimes heavily regulated. And so they, they typically do things to make their software more appealing to regulated customers. And those kinds of things come along the lines of um, the, the software development life cycle practices, the good engineering practices, good software quality assurance practices, the documented testing. Some of them go as far as to even validate their custom software because everything that you buy is custom from the supplier's point of view. They validate their custom software with all the deliverables, even using the same terminology that you'd have to use if you were building it. So if you went to audit a company that, um, that is doing it that way for the life science industry, you'll find that they've created IQs and OQs and sometimes tried to do PQs um, just to make it easier for you to audit and more acceptable for you. Some of them will even sell you validation protocols that, um, that you can use. They'll write the protocol because they know the system very well. You can buy it to speed up your validation effort. Um, everybody wins. The bad news is even if they validate their software, you can't just buy it and install it and then claim that it's validated for your use. Um, there's several reasons for that. For starters, um, when they validated it, uh, it was at their company. It might have been some time ago. It was on their computers, on their network. Um, you've, you've got to prove that it works at your locations. You also have to prove that it works for your users and their intended purpose. Uh, the company that built it maybe tried to simulate the processes and activities that they thought you were going to use the system for, um, but they don't know everything about you. So you have to show that it's fit for its intended purpose at your place. Uh, there's, there's always going to be an expectation that you conduct at least some validation work yourself. But if, um, if you go out and audit your software supplier, and I highly recommend that you do, um, and you find a lot of really good stuff and a lot of really complete testing, including maybe IQ, OQ, and PQ, you can leverage what they've done. Um, and, and this is even in GAMP 5. You know, if they've conducted, for instance, all this functional testing that goes into an OQ, testing the native function, uh, functionality of the software package, um, why should you go ha have to go retest all of those um, fairly detailed, deep level functions again? Um, you can, you can, if, you, if you go on a vendor audit and you have a knowledgeable person review their testing and come away with the impression that, hey, this works. Um, I have, I have uh, a good sense of assurance that they actually did this testing in the right way and a good sense of assurance that the software actually passed the tests. You can leverage that and just say, um, we're not going to do an OQ and here's why, or we're going to do a very limited OQ, just a smoke test, um, and, and here's why. It's because we conducted a successful supplier audit. And um, not having to write and execute an OQ, that, that gets rid of a serious amount of work, folks, on a big computer system. Um, you'll probably still be expected uh, to do some testing. You've got to install it on your own system, so you need something like an IQ. 
and you need to assure that it meets your unique requirements. So you probably need something like a PQ. Unless you know, you're buying um, a non-configurable piece of software that, um, oh, let's say it's associated with an analytical instrument or maybe a piece of um, manufacturing process equipment. Um, if, if I run the QC labs and I'm buying an HPLC, my user requirements are that it work like an HPLC. Um, and that's already been specified by the HPLC vendor. If I have user requirements, they're really in my, my validated analytical methods. So it, it's very often the case that all we do is execute vendor um, OQPV protocols or, or IQ, OQ, PQ protocols and call it a day. Um, it's always the best case to conduct your supplier audits on site. Um, some vendors will allow you to look at their, their testing and specification deliverables, say over WebEx remotely. Um, but I'm here to tell you uh, that's really difficult to do a good job. Uh, or I should say it's difficult to do a good job remotely. When you're on site at the vendor, you can have all of their documentation binders laid out in front of you and you'll find yourself going from one to the other to the other cross-checking. Uh, that's frankly impossible to do via WebEx. Uh, so I say go on site. It also allows you to ask uh, questions that occur to you of the right people. Um, and most life science vendors are happy to host you on an audit. Um, it takes some of their time and personnel to do it, uh, but, but they get essentially free consulting out of it because people keep coming in and telling them what they've got wrong and they can fix it. Final point on audits, uh, I think more often than not, companies tend to choose the, the software package they want and even buy it and then they get together a validation team and then they think about auditing the software supplier. Um, at that point, you know, you could argue that the audit is worthless because you have no leverage um, and you have no ability to walk away from the software if you go there and find out they're terrible at developing software and testing software. Best case is do the audit before you buy the software. Um, you can even uh, create you know, your user requirements and use them to develop a short list of software packages that you might be interested in. Audit more than one supplier and use the audit results to help you pick which software you're going to buy. What do you look for when you get on site? Well, you look at their basic quality management systems. Um, I say basic because it's basic blocking and tackling. Uh, do they train their people? How do they manage their, their own SOPs and other documents? Do they have um, a quality policy that states you know, what their stance on quality is? Do they have the right procedures in place um, covering software development, configuration management, project management, all that kind of stuff? Take a look at how they manage their own suppliers. Now, this is critically important in some software packages because you know, they may be developing most of it, but they may use software that they, they procure from other vendors. Um, how do you know that that software works? Well, part of it is their testing, um, but, but part of it is um, hopefully that they're doing a, a good job of due diligence and looking at the suppliers um, that they use. Um, the other part of it is your software supplier may use automated tools to do configuration management, to do bug tracking, to do um, automated testing. Um, if the automated testing software doesn't work, how can, you test, how can you trust the results of the test that you're looking at? Um, look, look deeply at their life cycle development processes, their software quality assurance practices, and so forth. Just go down the list. Um, I find that um, it, it typically takes me about a day and a half um, to look through the quality management processes, uh, the processes associated with uh, development and testing, 
and then the documented um, specifications and tests themselves. Um, so I recommend scheduling it for more than one day. So what is risk-based validation really? What do we mean when we talk about system risk? And just for purposes of discussion, we'll say that we classify systems as high risk, medium risk, or low risk. Um, typically, the risk comes mostly from the process or the records that the system is automating. And you look at factors when you do a risk assessment, uh, factors like how close is it to the patient, how close is it to the product, what is the risk to a patient or a product, um, or a highly regulated record like an adverse event record, um, if the system fails in some way. Uh, if, if you think about your facility, I'm going to use pharma as an example, um, a limb system that's used to complete an analytical data summary, uh, which is then used to decide whether to release the product for distribution or not. Um, the data acquisition and control software tied to the analytical instruments that are used to gather that, that data that goes into that report, um, those are very close to the product and hence considered very high risk software systems. Uh, same, same thing applies to software and computerized systems that, um, that are used to manufacture the product. As you back away from, from the product um, into, say, automated systems that manage your change control or that manage your investigations or, or deviations, these could have an impact on product-related activities, but it would be an indirect impact. And those systems start to sound more like medium computerized systems. Um, if, you, if you've got a system that tracks, uh, keeps track of and manages your training records, well, those are still regulated records, but you might even call that a low-risk system. Uh, same thing for a, a document management system that manages your SOPs. Your SOPs are vitally important, but what's the risk if, if, the, um, if the system goes down? Well, okay, you can't get at your SOPs, but we always have paper backup SOPs, you know, just in case that happens. Well, um, then maybe that's a low-risk system. And that really drives how much validation work you need to do in order to prove that the system works and is suitable for its intended purpose. If you have a high-risk system, you better be sure that the system functions the way you expect it to and will continue to do so over time. Um, because you have limited time, money, and people, those are the systems, the types of systems, that you need to focus the bulk of your attention on. You're going to generate typically more documentation, and that documentation is going to be thicker because you're doing more work, more specification work and testing work. For the lower risk systems, you can get away with doing less, and the FDA actually expects that. Um, they expect you to be focusing on the higher risk systems. So in a nutshell, risk-based validation means that lower risk systems can be validated with less effort. The caveat there is because you're doing less, you may miss some things that you wouldn't have missed if you'd done more. But since they're low-risk systems, the impact of the things that you might miss is probably going to be low. There's one more element. Excuse me. There's one more element that needs to be considered when you're deciding what activities and deliverables you need to do in a validation effort. And that's the system complexity. Um, GAMP, as I mentioned before, categorizes software as either a category, well, for purposes of our discussion today, category three, four, or five. Um, category three is non-configured. It is what it is. Uh, you buy it, and it does what it does. You can't change it. Category four is configured. It may be configurable, but you're not changing it, or it may be configured, um, meaning you change it to match your own processes. If you do change it, you'll have to document and test what you do. So there's a couple more documents you're going to have to create. Um, with Category 3, you may get away with a lot less. 
here's an example. Low risk category three activities or deliverables might include a validation plan, a user requirement specification, um, an IQ, no OQ, but a PQ to make sure it meets the user requirements, a trace matrix to tie the requirements uh, to the testing, and a validation report. As you get into Category 4, configured, you're going to have to add things that track the configurations you're making and uh, the, the extra testing that you're doing. Um, I just want to say that um, a lot of factors can change what you deliver. You might deliver less because you've got a Category 3 system attached to an instrument, or you might have to deliver more. It's really uh, up to a room full of smart people called your validation team. All right, uh, I'm running out of time, but luckily this goes quickly. Part 11 is easy, folks. The whole point of Part 11 is so that inspectors can inspect your records even though they're on computers. When they were on paper, inspectors could see everything, a single line through an old value, a new value, initial and date, and typically a reason why it changed. That went away when computers first started being used. And F FDA came up with Part 11 to make sure that they could inspect and see changes to data and to make sure that um, uh, electronic signatures or approvals to regulated records were done in a compliant way with the same legal weight as a wet ink signature. Part 11 doesn't apply to every computer system that you'll validate. It applies to mainly to systems that um, take care of records that are required by predicate rule, meaning another FDA regulation, or um, that uh, apply e-signatures that are required by a predicate rule. There are two broad areas of coverage from a regulatory perspective, security and integrity of the electronic record itself, and security, integrity, and legal binding of electronic signatures if they're used. Uh, companies typically look at it in a different way. Two broad considerations again. One is the technical compliance of the software. The other is the administrative and procedural compliance that your company has to wrap around that Part 11 regulated system. If Part 11 does apply to your system, um, the list of things that you need to do to make it Part 11 compliant is well known. And um, you know, if you need help with that, we could certainly help you. All you have to do is take that list and make them requirements, put them into your specifications, and then test them as part of your validation testing. Um, once again, if the software supplier has already tested their software for Part 11, you might be able to leverage their testing that they've already done. Um, and just a note, if, if you've been used to Part 11 not being enforced, because they really haven't enforced it much at all um, since 2003, uh, they're back. Last year, um, FDA announced that um, they would start inspecting computer compliance. Uh, specifically Part 11. Uh, there have been a lot of tag-along, uh, sorry, tag-along Part 11 oriented inspectors. Uh, they might show up for a PAI, they might show up for um, a biennial inspection. And while everybody else is looking at the uh, standard quality systems, uh, these guys are looking at computers very closely. Um, warning letters cropping up late last year. Um, I'm aware of another three this year um, with many observations related to computer systems. And they don't call out Part 11 in the 483. They typically call out the predicate rule, but um, it's all about computer compliance. So this is where you pay for your lunch or your webinar. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how USDM can help you with your computer compliance needs. We got a lot of smart people who've been there and done that. Um, you may too, um, and if you do, that's great. However, if you don't have people who have validation and Part 11 experience, or you don't have enough to handle your workload, um, we can come in, we can apply our expertise, 
um, we can we can staff up your projects and, and dramatically speed up your, your validation efforts and help you meet go live dates. If Part 11 applies to your system, uh, we've been there and done that too. We can help. We can also do your software supplier audits, and now you know that those things are actually critically important. We can give you detailed reports of what we find and uh, also make recommendations as to what you can leverage and how to go about doing it. We also have our own pre-done validation work for a number of different types of applications. We call them validation accelerator packs. And if you want to leverage validation accelerator packs, most of your validation work is already done, so you'll start the project with a lot of the deliverable work already done. We have all those assessments and specifications and IQO, QPQs and trace matrices, all those things we talked about. Um, we can bring them in. They just need to be tailored to your company, your site, your processes, how you use the system. Um, but our experts can do that very quickly. We have, um, uh, I put in a slide here that listed uh, mostly, or it looks like all Oracle applications, but uh, we're not limited to Oracle applications. I think I put in Oracle here because I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, that one Oracle package. Uh, but um, if you look at these ERP and safety, drug safety, and learning management, and uh, PLM, packages from Oracle. Um, just think in terms of other vendors, safety and training and, and ERP packages, and uh, we have a number of those as well. Last thing I want to talk about, and it looks like, I apologize ahead of time, I haven't left time for questions and answers, but um, Oracle and USDM have a partnership that revolves around GRC, which stands for Governance, Risk Management, and Compliance. They have a software system called eGRCM, or Enterprise GRC Manager. And it's been used outside the life sciences industry to tackle compliance and regulatory challenges like Sarbanes-Oxley and HIPAA and OSHA and um, the need for enterprise governance and IT governance. And we recognized that instead of putting in, um, let's say, SOX controls, and testing those, we could take a validation accelerator pack or your own uh, requirements and specifications and put those into eGRCM and then put in our IQ, OQ, PQ test cases into eGRCM and actually automate the process of validation and approve those things and those test steps electronically and capture objective evidence, screen prints and reports electronically and once again, further speed up the validation effort. And then wind up with all of those validation deliverables in electronic form executed and approved, which means an inspector may not even have to come on site if they want to audit the work that you've done. And with that, once again, I apologize, Becky, I'll turn it over to you, but I have used up all the time. And well worth every minute, Jerry. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Uh, we will open the floor for a few questions, and I have some of them uh, ready for you now. Um, but I want to mention again to everyone, the session has been recorded and will be on our website. It generally takes uh, just around 24 hours to get that posted, and the link will be uh, audio recording as well as the slide presentation so that you can review or share with team members at your convenience. Uh, Jerry, the first question is um, from Manish. He's wanting to know, can supplier audits be ignored for low-risk COTS software, so off-the-shelf uh, system software? Um, I wouldn't say ignored, um, but yes, to your point, um, functionally they can. Um, I would, in your, in your validation procedure or if you have a separate procedure covering, um, by procedure I mean SOP, covering supplier audits, I would state in there for high risk systems and medium risk systems you have to do this. For low risk systems you can do less, meaning um, mm -hmm. if you choose to you can conduct an on-site audit. If you choose not to go on-site you can maybe conduct a postal audit. Just send a questionnaire and get their response. Or, you know, 
you can um, leave it up to the validation team. Within the procedure, you can say, you know, validation team will make the decision as to whether or not it is required. Even for a high-risk system, um, there may be some reason that the team feels they don't need to go on site, and they would simply document that in uh, the validation plan along with the rationale for why. Uh, on the other end, if you've got a low-risk system from a vendor that's, you know, Joe's, uh, Joe's Drug Safety, well, Drug Safety is not a low-risk system, Joe's Training Record Management Shop, um, you might want to go on site anyway, even though it's low-risk, because you need to know that you can trust Joe. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, we have a, an attendant here that says that they struggle with differentiating between pure computer system ERP document type uh, validation versus equipment control system. Can you help there? Well, I hope I understand this question correctly. Um, at a high level, um, I think what, what the attendee is asking is um, what do we, what do we do, how do we recognize you know, when, when something is pure computer versus recognizing when it's computerized equipment versus something in the middle? So an ERP system, pure computerized system. Um, uh, um, coming up with an example here, uh, uh, a scale, a digital scale, pure equipment. But what about something in the middle, like that HPLC with the PC attached? Okay, so write yourself a procedure. Spend some time thinking about it. Um, I certainly have one I can sell you um, around computer validation and another one around equipment qualification. Sometimes you'll be using the equipment qualification one only. Sometimes the computer validation one only. Sometimes you'll have to use both of them, in other words, once the lab equipment gets, or, or manufacturing equipment gets um, more computerized, you'll have to hand it over to the computer validation SOP. Um, it's, it's fairly well qualified in, in the industry, but not every company has been there and done that. There are good guidance documents from GAMP on um, what to do to qualify computerized equipment in, in the process area and what to do to qualify it in the lab area. Um, there's guidance from USP on how to classify computerized lab equipment um, and generally what should be done um, in the different categories. But really you need, you need your own procedure. Um, you need something that will allow you to assess computerized systems and um, do the right thing in a repeatable way. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we do have a question from Jagdish um, wanting to know, do you help with legacy system gap analysis and software upgrades? You bet, um, both of those. Um, a software upgrade is nothing more than you know, another validation effort. So we're highly experienced at that. Um, it, it could even be less than that. In other words, if you're doing a small software upgrade, a patch, a, a small change, you, you might need just a change control and uh, attached to the change control you have some screenshots before and after, very simple requalification. Or it could be a version upgrade or you could be doing something like starting to use a module of SAP or EBS that you've never used before, in which case it's a fairly major validation effort with all those deliverables we were looking at earlier. Um, as far as legacy systems, yeah, um, a lot of us went through the initial um, Part 11 um, remediation efforts back in the late 90s and early 2000s where it was all about gap analyses. So we can certainly do that. and take a look at how compliant your validation state is, uh, as well as uh, how well your system holds up to Part 11. Uh, nice segue to our next question. Mel is asking, how is single sign-on SSO technology covered in Part 11? Um, that's a good question. Um, in general, let me tackle this a couple different ways. Uh, if you're using single sign-on like um, 
So say you're using an LDAP directory or, or a Kerberos or you know, Active Directory, LDAP or other. Um, really, all you're doing is, is having a different way of, uh, a different system do the authentication and possibly the authorization of your users. Um, your, your validated computer system isn't doing it. It's just passing through those credentials. Um, so part of it would be your functional testing around basic security, your positive and negative testing uh, for authentication, user logins, um, and testing to make sure that you know, at the different authorization levels for users in your system, um, they can see what they need to see and can't get at what they're not supposed to get at. That's true for every system regardless of whether you're using single sign-on. Um, if your single sign-on system includes um, smart tokens or biometric devices, Part 11 covers those fairly heavily and, and requires those things to be uh, tested and um, requires you to have loss recovery or compromise recovery procedures. And uh, gosh, I was going to say something else and I forgot. Oh yes, if, if you have an external system doing your, your authentication and, and your authorization, something like an Active Directory or, or any other type of, of, of security system, it also needs some level of validation. Um, we could probably get into that in more detail maybe down the road if we did an IT infrastructure qualification session. But I'm not saying you have to fully validate it the way you validate your system that's doing regulated GXP work. But think about it. That single sign-on system has now become the gateway uh, and, and the electrified fence that protects your validated regulated system. So you're going to have to put some controls on it too, and you're going to have to do some documented testing, um, or you run the risk of an observation there. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Cicely is asking, at the start of the presentation, you mentioned that predicate rules apply to the regulated records. What classifies a regulated record besides adverse events? Um, that's a broad question. <laughs> well, um, you've got, for instance, you've got FDA regulations that require um, when you become aware of an adverse event associated with um, the use of one of your drug products or the use of a device um, that you create a report, um, both one that you will use internally, of course, and then uh, a med, well, uh, a report that you would send to FDA to notify them that that um, an adverse event has, has occurred. That would be a regulated record. You have um, in in Part 820, you have the requirement that you do, um, as I said, um, uh, design controls on your devices. You have to um, document. Um, how, how the, the device was designed and how it was developed. You have to document changes to the design, changes to the device. You have to document testing. All of those are regulated records. You're required to uh, train your personnel so that they have the correct education, training, and experience to do their job. That has to be documented. That becomes a regulated record. Basically, you have to go through the regulations that apply to you and look for all of the cases where a required record is called out. Those become what I'm calling records required by predicate rule. Um, when you automate those, you need to validate your system. And typically, Part 11 also applies because you're using a system to automate a regulated record. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Glenn is asking a question around the design qualification. It was mentioned briefly in accordance with IT use. Can you explain the purpose of DQ relative to the IQOQPQ organization? Um, yeah, and I'll tackle this in terms of, um, of support system validation rather than, say, in the device world, um, you would use design qualification 
as part of your design controls when you're writing software that's going to be embedded in the device. Um, that's kind of a separate issue. But if you're talking computerized support systems, as we've pretty much been talk talking about today, um, the design qualification is, is it's been talked about for a long time, but the use of that terminology is sort of going away. It's still a requirement that you, you verify that the proper, um, the proper design controls have been used in the creation of software. And those are along the lines of the good specification and design practices, the good software engineering practices, the software quality assurance practices, um, all those things that I talked about. But since we typically buy our software for support systems, um, it's, it's our responsibility to assure they're in place, but it's really the vendor's, the supplier's responsibility to do them. So a big part of our design qualification is actually getting on site at the supplier and reviewing everything they've done in that area. Um, certain companies that are almost completely life science oriented or, or very heavily life science oriented, like say an Agilent or a Waters that sells tons of instrument and software into the labs, they may actually um, supply you with a document set that's called design qualification when they sell you the software so that you have something to show an inspector. In, in the case of those companies, of course, the inspector is not even going to look at it because they know those companies very well already. Tremendous. And we'll take our last question from Greg. It's a quick follow-up to the audit question. Because if you are auditing a supplier, excuse me, a software supplier, and they sub out some of their software development to India, how far do you take the audit trail? It depends on the risk associated with the system. It depends on um, your relationship with, with the supplier. And um, it depends on what you find when you when you um, when you go to the supplier's site um, initially. So let's take as an example from my past uh, an IVR system, an interactive voice response, interactive web response system. Um, we took an initial look at um, at what had been done by flying to England, um, where the um, where the um, supplier was headquartered. We actually did that twice, and we had continued issues because the software was actually both developed and validated uh, in India. Um, so the second time around, we wound up also going to India. But I would say um, your mileage may vary. Uh, if you go to your supplier and you, you can review all of the documentation you need to review at, at the uh, I'll, I'll just say local <laughs> supplier site, and you get a good assurance from it, um, then maybe you can call it good there. Uh, if you look at it and the hairs start to stand up on the back of your neck, um, maybe you're going to be on the plane to India. And um, over a beer, I'll tell you how those kinds of trips go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. All right. I appreciate so many of you uh, staying with us through the uh, presentation and the questions. Uh, been just tremendous. Thank you again, Jerry. Uh, we do um, trust the information that we've shared has been helpful, and we welcome, of course, your comments and feedback that can assist us with continual improvement. And we're certainly open to suggestions for future presentation uh, topics. Anything that we can help you uh, along your path there, we'd love to share. We do encourage you to join the discussion on LinkedIn and to visit our website so you can review the topics for upcoming webinar events across the USDM practices. On behalf of the USDM team, we do appreciate the opportunity to team with you towards excellence and compliance. Have a wonderful day.